Hello. Before we get started, I would just like to give a shout out to the organizers and the fellow speakers at React Summit. It's been a really great conference so far and you're all doing a great job. Today I'll be talking about web performance. My name is Rich. I'm known as Richie McCall on GitHub and Twitter. I'm a front end engineer and I work at a company called The Zone in London. I'm from Glasgow, Scotland originally. You can probably tell from the accent. And before I start talking about web performance, I'll just give a quick introduction into what we do at The Zone. So The Zone is a live and on-demand sports streaming service. And we're live in nine markets around the world. And we're providing millions of customers with access to the sports that they would like to watch. The team I'm working in is responsible for living room devices. And what living room devices is can be broken down into three categories. So we have smart TVs, which is like Samsung, Toshiba, Panasonic TVs. We've got games consoles, which is PS4, PS5, Xbox, and also set-top boxes, which is Comcast, Fire TV, and SkyQ. And so to put performance in the context of what we do at The Zone, the kind of problems that we face are to do with low memory and CPU targets, resource competition on the main thread. For example, you have playback running in the background, and the user's trying to navigate content. And at the same time, maintaining smooth 60 frames per second interactions when the customers are navigating content. And the data doesn't lie, right? Fast websites equals a better user experience. This is what customers prefer, and it's something that we should be striving towards. So this data from the Cloudflare getting faster white paper demonstrates some kind of useful quotes Conversions go down 7% due to just one additional second of load time. And 39% of users stop engaging with a website if images take too long to load. And another great quote from Craig Maud's essay on fast software is that, to me, speedy software is a difference between an application smoothly integrating into your life and one called upon with great reluctance. And as users of software, we can definitely relate to this at one point or another. So today what we'll be covering is understanding the method of measure analyzing and fixing. We'll briefly touch on the user time and API that the browser provides. We'll have a live demo of measuring and analyzing, slow running JavaScript code. I'll introduce the rendering technique of virtualization. I'll speak briefly about the performance problems we faced at the zone. And finally, I'll fix the performance bottleneck that we have in the demo. The measure, analyze, and fix cycle is a methodology that I tend to use when doing performance audits. So before we can analyze and fix a problem, we first have to measure. Measure will give us the baseline that we need to analyze the problem, really. Once we analyze the problem, we can then propose a fix. Once we fix, we then measure again. And this cycle repeats until we've got a new number that we're happy with when we measure. I've got a demo, small front-end application, it's available on this GitHub URL. The setup instructions are on the README, so if you fancy following along, then please feel free. So I'll switch over to the demo here that I've got running. And this application is just a small front-end application that uses the SpaceX API to render a list of launches from new to old. And the interaction that we'll be profiling is changing the order of launches. So if I click this button, I'm now viewing the oldest launches of SpaceX. So to, prof to profile this thing, what we'll do is go into developer tools in Chrome and we'll use the performance panel. And we'll come to the CPU option here and click six times slowdown. We'll then come over here and press record. And what we'll do is we'll just interact with this feature a few times just to get some data and stop the recording. Okay, great. So what we can see here is there's quite a lot going on. What we're really concerned about is this section here. So this section is the main thread. And for those who aren't aware of what happens on the main thread, I'll quickly jump over to a different slide and we can explain the theory behind it. So this image here is from Paul Lewis's blog post called The Anatomy of a Frame. And essentially, the browser performs a different set of tasks 
at any given time to get stuff on the screen. So when we're profiling and we see any yellow, we know that JavaScript has been executed. Anytime that we see purple, we know that style or layout has been calculated. And anytime we see green, we know that there's some paint or compositing to the screen happening. So if I switch back over to that demo, now that we understand a little bit about what the colors mean, if we were to analyze this interaction, we can see here that we've got our click event. There's some yellow, which means there's some JavaScript being executed. There's some purple, which means there's style, some layout. And finally, there's a little bit of green, which means the paint update happens on the screen. So let's quickly jump into how we measure stuff. But before we do that, I want to quickly touch on this topic, which is we always want to measure against the production build. The reason for this is that development libraries such as React have code in the development build that isn't in the production build, which means that the code that users or customers may be experiencing isn't the same as what you would be working with in a development build. So always measure the production builds just to get a real sense of the numbers. With that being said, how do we measure? That's the first question we have to answer. That brings me on to the user timings API. And the user timings API is provided by the browser and we can access it through window performance, which is an object. There are a few useful methods on window performance, such as mark. And what mark does is it creates a high resolution timestamp and we can associate that timestamp with a name. We can then later access these timestamps using window performance measure. In this example, I've created two, two timestamps, one create mark start and the other create mark end. We can then later access these using window performance measure. A window performance measure creates a new timestamp, but it, it calculates the duration between a start and an end. Using window performance measure is how we visualize stuff in developer tools. Okay, so now we know a little bit about frames, we know how to measure, Let's jump into the demo and start trying to create a baseline. So the first thing that we could do is if we think about the interaction that we were profiling, when we click that button, the state changes and the ordering of the cards update on the screen. So one thing we could do is we could create the first timestamp, which will be the start inside the on-click event of the button. So I'll jump over to VS Code here and we can just have a look at the code. So this is the demo application locally. We've got the latest launch list component, which is just a functional component that has the button and renders a list of launches. So inside here, inside the on-click, let's mark the start. So that's the first thing we have to do. In order to mark the end, we have to use some instrumentation code. And this instrumentation code is just a custom hook that we'll use to store the value from the previous render inside the ref. I'll copy this custom hook. And the way that we will use this is like so. We have an effect that runs after render that compares the previous order, which we've used in the custom hook, and we compare it against the new order prop. If those two values are different, we know the state has changed and we can mark the end of that transition. So if I copy and paste this, You just put it here. That should give us something to analyze and measure in developer tools. So now let's switch back over to the demo. That's reloaded. So I'll just clear this recording, press record again. And again, I'll just interact. I'll just change the order of launches a few times. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. Let's take this one, for example. As you can see, in this user timing section, we've now got a new measure. This is the measure that we've just added just to get some understanding of what the baseline is. So armed with the theory that we had for frames, we can obviously see that this combination of JavaScript, style, layout, and paint is roughly 634 milliseconds for that interaction. Also remember that we added instrumentation code. So we want to subtract the, the instrumentation code from that number. So this here 
will be that instrumentation code around 58 milliseconds. So if we remove 58 from 634, we're roughly around 500, 550 milliseconds. So that is the, the kind of baseline that we're working with. So if we think about what happens during that interaction, we're changing the order of cards, right? So the question is how many cards or launches do we have in the DOM? One quick way to do this would be to change over to the elements tab and look for the containing element. So if we look at this element here, this has got the list of launches. If I click those three dots, store as a global variable, <clears throat> it means that I can now access this element and I can read some properties on it. For example, child element count, which will give me the amount of launches that we've got. So what we're dealing with here is 102 items in the DOM. So this is obviously causing a lot of work for the browser to do every time that we do that transition. So how could we mitigate this? How could we fix this problem? That brings me on to the technique of virtualization. So virtualization, also known as windowing, um, is a way to efficiently render large lists of content. I actually personally think windowing is a better term for this concept. If we look at this image here from the web dev article, which I highly recommend reading, this really illustrates the concept. So the user is only looking at maybe a certain amount of items on screen at any given time. But also there are some off screen items that the user doesn't see initially. If, let's say for example, the user likes to scroll fast. So the window would then change over a subset of that list. And it's an efficient way to kind of render content like if you've got a large, a large list. So before we apply this technique in the demo, I'll take a little detour around the work we were doing at the zone. So we adopted the virtualization at the zone. And before we adopted it, we were using like a, a lazy loading approach of rendering content. And what you can see from this GIF is that when you're going up and down the content, we are just changing the window of what the user sees at any given time. The problem we had before was that as the user was interacting and going up and down the content, we were lazily loading content in and changing the DOM and updating new elements. The problem with that on low end devices is that it actually causes significant lag and significant jank in the user experience. So we wanted to remove that in order to provide a good user experience across all these different devices. And so virtualization really helped here. And this is just the vertical example. Here is the horizontal example without any animation. So as you can see, there's only maybe five items horizontally on screen at any given time. Off screen items, there's a maybe two on either side. So if the user's going fast, for example, the have the remote and they hold down right or they hold down left, then the rendering is quite efficient because all we're doing is just changing the subset of the view. It's also worth speaking about the constraints on TV and how they're slightly different than the constraints you may be faced with on mobile web. For example, on TV, one of the big problems is focus management and maintaining consistent focus throughout different pages. Another one is the wide range of hardware specifications. For example, some of these devices have really low memory, low CPU, and some have okay memory CPU. And also we're dealing with a wide range of browser engines. I think the oldest browser that we support is Safari 6, which is quite old. And obviously that means that there's a lack of modern web standards. At the same time, there's also lack of developer tools, which means that it's really tricky to navigate this landscape when working with performance. And when we're building this front end application at the zone, we're writing it once and we're running it everywhere across these different devices. So any technique that we use, such as virtualization, has to prove effective across all these different devices. 